Hello. Hi. Hey. How's it going? Good. This is Nick. Nick's going to present about uh, one of the more dangerous aspects of what we have Oh, here. okay. Well, <laughs> sorry. Hopefully it doesn't end up dangerous for you. Correct. Do you want me to get you a soldering iron? So you oh, I it? have a soldering iron, but not like on me. Do you have one? Yeah, we have one in the other room. I can bring it over for you. Oh, I have one in my bag. Oh, well, do you want to go grab it? You can do the intro. I'll do the I'll little do intro. Thing. I'll do the song and dance. Uh, so soldering is heating up metal, uh, a special type of metal, to connect other metals to create a conductive surface that allows you to create uh, circuits that last. In your kits right now, you have a breadboard. Breadboard will allow you to create prototypes, but if you wanted to start solidifying some of these or making them hard and hold together for eternity, you would solder them together. Um, Nick is gonna give you the next foundational piece past the electronics fundamentals, which is wiring, soldering, and prototyping. So here is Nick. All right, thanks. All right, my name's Nick. I'm on Twitter and GitHub as Matt Meld. And in real life, I work for the Museum of Modern Art in New York. But for now, we're going to talk about robots and hardware stuff. Uh, just rocket quick overview of what these three topics are. Wiring is just like how you're going to connect all these different components and how you're going to decide how to do that and what sort of things. Soldering is, like uh, Chris was saying, when you need to kind of like super glue those things together, you've decided how you want it to be and you want your product to kind of like stick together. And prototyping is how you have kind of like this long-term vision, uh, but currently you're like not really sure. You just kind of want to build like a quick MVP kind of thing in hardware. So you've got a good understanding of circuits now, like the power wants to go from high voltage to low voltage, and on the way you can put these little obstacles to turn on lights and do cool things. And then you can have like switches to change when the current comes and goes. And you've probably gotten, or you've probably seen these before, or you have them in your kit now, like different LEDs and resistors and diodes, which are these different components. So you've got the components, you've got the circuits. How do you understand some big thing like this? And fortunately, all these basic concepts scale up. So if you understand how one circuit works, you can look at something like this and take it apart and say, OK, well, this one, an LED, a resistor, a wire, connect to each other. And even when you have something like an Arduino, which has all these pins, it looks really complicated, all they're really using it for here is it has a power and it has a ground. And when you look up close at a, any kind of these microcontrollers, you're going to see about the same thing. So wiring, I think we've all opened some electronic device and seen like some really huge tangle of wires before. And it seems like it could be this really inconvenient nightmare kind of a situation. But today, you're probably going to be working with breadboards. You've got one in your Spark Core kit, and we also got one in our Arduino kit this morning. And breadboards are kind of like the Lego of electronics. Like, nothing's built for you. Like, none of these are actually complete circuits. Uh, but when you start putting things together, you probably want to start connecting them on this base, like, breadboard. Um, and it's cool to have a diagram, like, open while you're starting to work with this breadboard. Um, but all the rows. Each row has its own kind of wire connecting those holes. And then on the side, you have two long like columns, which are usually used for the power and ground. So if you're ever like, oh, it sounds like I need power and ground a lot, you have like a ton of pins devoted to that. Um, just kind of give you like a real world example of that. Like you got the Spark Core kit in the mail, and that has like the Spark Core actually already on a breadboard for you. And when it's plugged in like that, you can imagine it being kind of like a millipede. Like each one of those little pins on the side has a wire branching out and onto the breadboard. So you have a couple places where you can kind of plug something in and connect it to your spark core. Uh, and then you can also connect the power and ground. So like everything that you have coming in, for, the electricity you have coming in from your computer, you're going to have be consistent with everything on your board. Up close, uh, unfortunately, this isn't really a great picture. I just took it the other day. Um, but you can make that circuit with a resistor and an LED uh, without programming your spark core or anything. Like it, when you plug in your spark core, it has a power and it has a ground. The power is labeled 3.3 volts, and you just kind of like make a circuit. And so this is a valid circuit because you plug things into the breadboard, and the resistor is connected to that 
uh, connected vertically to that. Like everything lines up and the circuit goes around like that. Um, it just, if you look at a breadboard circuit diagram, it makes it a little bit easier to follow. Uh, so the first picture that I showed you of a circuit was this uh, battery connected to some lights. And then the one I just showed you had a resistor. And this was covered briefly in the previous talk. But like as you, if voltage equals current times resistance, and you lower the resistance but keep the voltage constant, that means the current is going to get really big. So that's how LEDs get burned out, is if there's nothing impeding that flow of current from your battery, like it's going to be a huge amount of current. It's going to drain your battery. It's going to burn your LEDs. It's not going to be cool. Um, just like you wouldn't drive a car without brakes, you shouldn't make a circuit without some kind of thing in the way to kind of slow down these electrons and the electric current. So use a resistor. Use them often. If you're putting together a circuit, think, is there something that's taking up like part of the electric current, kind of slowing it from just flooding through here. And if you look at any of these like uh, Adafruit tutorials and things like that, they'll come with diagrams which explain everything. They have the breadboard. They show you where you should put your resistor. They show you where you should put an LED. And look, each one of them is being given a separate circuit in this diagram. So it's actually pretty helpful. If you look at any of these things online, they'll say, here's how you use your breadboard. And even if they look slightly different, like their board, breadboard, their LEDs look slightly different, I mean, they're the, same, they're the same basic concept. So you shouldn't have to worry about something looking slightly different. Uh, overall, with wiring, like wires don't really know. They're, like, they work in both directions. Uh, they should be interchangeable. Some of different connectors. Just use the connector that makes the most sense. Like if you plug into your breadboard, you want it to be a certain kind of wire. If you plug into... Uh, one of these things that has like little screw holes, you want another kind of wire. Like they should be interchangeable, uh, even if it looks different from the instructions, it should be okay. Uh, except over like long distances, or if you're doing like audio or media video, usually like they try to have certain special wires for that case. But if you have like a handheld robot, probably the kind of wires you're using won't affect you too much. Um, when you're debugging your circuit, like something doesn't work quite right, uh, pro tip, look at your LED, see if it's pointed in the right direction. Uh, unlike wires, LEDs only work in one direction. And um, so you have like a setup like this, and they actually, when they create LEDs, they make one leg shorter than the other, and they make one side kind of flat. So it's actually possible to tell. But just in some case, like your circuit seems like it should work, and it isn't, just turn the LED around and it might help you, save you a lot of time. But the best way to debug any circuit is if you have a multimeter, it might look like this, it might look a little different. It's basically like the inspect element or binding.pry or debugger of real life. You just get the two little probes and you touch them to any one of your components and you can see, are these things connected? Is electricity flowing through here? Is there like a voltage drop here? Like did I make my circuit correctly? If you play around with the multimeter a little bit, you'll figure out what's going on in your circuit. Um, so your next step after you build like your first circuit and get an LED, you're like, well, wait, I want to make an Internet of Things, Bluetooth, sensing kind of thing. Well, so there are a few different ways you can move forward when, with wiring. One of them is like connecting black boxes. And I don't say that in like a negative way. Like you're not going to make your own Bluetooth chip just, you know, with your own kind of like putting some transistors on a breadboard. Like it's totally okay if you get a Bluetooth chip and connect it to your Arduino and that's how you do Bluetooth. Um, another way is you can write code. Like you say, I don't know how to make a circuit where when this switch happens and this switch happens, this light blinks. Like I don't know how to make a circuit that does that. But you can program an Arduino or your Spark core to do that. So it makes sense in a way that if you know how to write code and you're not so sure about circuits, just like make each pin on your thing do one thing and then have the code figure out the logic. Uh, the other option is you could learn a lot of electrical engineering. Uh, I mean, that's also a good method. It takes several years uh, if you want, to, depending on the level you want to reach. Uh, I actually don't know very much beyond, like, if you take, like, an intro course, they'll teach you how to do, like, flip-flops and timers and things, which are pretty cool once you understand how they all fit together, but you might not be able to get to that step, like, today. And then soldering. So I have a soldering iron. Um, so you've probably seen at some point in your life, if you haven't seen soldering, you've seen people, like, welding, Right, you get the two pieces of metal, and then there's like sparks and stuff. We're not going to do welding today, and but if someone does do welding, that would be really cool, though. 
Um, but soldering is much smaller scale. You basically, you plug this thing in, it gets very hot at the tip, and then you get solder, which is a, a coil of solder, which is this very soft metal, and a little thing of solder comes out, and you touch it, you touch them to your board, and then when you touch your soldering iron to the board, actually there's a really close up diagram here. Yeah, when you touch your soldering iron to the board, it's gonna get very hot at that point, enough that when you touch the solder to that same kind of point, a little bead of it will melt off and kind of encapsulate that. It won't work perfectly the first time, but it actually works out pretty okay. So it's important to understand you're not actually trying to like get the solder and melt stuff off of it using your soldering iron, because then you'll just get metal all over the soldering iron tip. You kind of want to heat up the component itself so that it kind of wants to have solder onto it. Um, how much solder? Like, uh, this takes a couple of tries to get right, uh, but you just kind of want a little bead, just enough so it doesn't move out of the way. And then when you take the soldering iron, it'll just solidify and it'll be solid. If you put too much solder, it could look really ugly like this, or you could even have, like, if there are a lot of pins next to each other, it'll just be like a big bead of solder and they'll be electronically connected to each other, and then you'll only be able to use one of those pins without it influencing the other. So try to use just the minimum amount of solder to get it to stay on. And it's okay, like, try on some larger things ahead of time, and then you can get it right on smaller things. But this is mostly permanent, so if you're not really sure how your circuit is, stay with the breadboard for a while, try different things out. Uh, once you actually get to this, it's kind of like super glue. You don't want to have it, like, try it and then say, wait, wait, I want to move my components all around. Uh, and also, it does get very hot, like it is melting metal with your hands. So try not to like touch the tip or the whole like, like shaft of the soldering iron while it's hot. Even after you unplug it, it takes some time to cool down, put it in like a space where it's not going to burn paper or something like that. Um, and also, it heats up not just the part where you're touching the solder, but anything that's like electronically connected to the thing that you're soldering. So if you're connecting to, if you're soldering one piece of your Arduino and then you touch another piece of your Arduino, it could actually be really hot depending on how the wires are inside. So just kind of have a conscious mind that you're working with a very hot kind of power tool kind of thing. Uh, and also you actually can undo. Someone told me not to show you this slide because like they just, it's like super glue, it's actually. But actually, there's like some ways to do it. There's like a little balloon thing you can squeeze onto it and kind of like blow the solder out of the way while it's wet. Um, but don't try to do this on your own the first time. Like try to work with some people, see if you can do it just with the soldering iron or some other things. Just the best thing you can do is use small bits of solder at a time and try not to solder until you're really sure you want that connection to be. Um, finally, prototyping. What is prototyping? Uh, I actually saw this on Twitter. I used to work with Code for America, and I saw these people sharing this photo. And the note says, use prototypes to ask more informed questions. It doesn't say use prototypes to get Kickstarter funding. It says use it to ask more informed questions. Um, so in the beginning, your product or your idea or whatever industry you're going into, in the beginning, you're not really sure how it's going to turn out. And in the early stages, it's going to look really weird. You're not really going to know what the right thing is. Uh, this is kind of like Google Glass looked like about like 10, 15 years ago. Has anyone seen this picture before? Just like people would have to wear tons and tons of computers, but they still did it because they were researching it. They were like, this is going to be really cool someday. They wanted to try it. Uh, it doesn't even have to like work exactly. So maybe someone in the room will know if this is a true story, but I heard that like Steve Jobs would carry a wooden block the size and shape of the next iPhone to come out and just carry it around and just be like, when is this inconvenient? When is this like, you know, when do I forget this in my pants pocket? You know, things like that. Even though it did absolutely nothing, it was kind of like informing them like, oh, this is something I should keep working on or, or this is a problem that's gonna come up when we build the actual thing. Uh, this is also uh, a good example of iteration. Has anyone seen this Kickstarter for Pantelligent? Ooh, Pantelligent, yes. So the idea is, I, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know if this is actually like a true thing, but the idea is that if you can precisely use this uh, temperature sensor and things to control the temperature of the pan, that it's actually gonna help you cook your food really well, like to perfect precision and temperature and things. 
So the first prototype is this big giant black box attached to a frying pan. It's like something's no one, on the left side, you look, that's like a year ago, no one was going to buy that. And then over time, they've made it smaller, they've kind of gone to this number of things, and then the final thing on the right, which they've put on Kickstarter, they've actually like custom formed exactly the kind of thing they want. It has a Bluetooth chip so it can talk to an app on your phone. Uh, and they even, the Kickstarter, I really appreciate that they did this, they show like all the different prototyping steps they did, including this is like, they started with a breadboard. Like you guys, they're gonna have a breadboard. Because all they need is like a Bluetooth chip and a temperature sensor and some place for it all to like come together. So yeah, they start out with a breadboard and then a year later they have like a custom built uh, chip that they got from, presumably from China or Taiwan, I don't know exactly. Um, and so they have a lot of really good pictures on that site. Uh, and then here's another uh, Arduino prototype. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Yeah, another Arduino prototype. Uh, personally, I've worked with one laptop per child. They're a pretty cool project. And this is basically a prototype. No one really knew what a computer for the developing world should or should not do or look like. Uh, so they built it. Uh, not everything worked exactly as they might have liked. But it was a pretty interesting project. And then a couple years ago, they were saying, you know, we need to get more into this DIY maker kind of idea. So we'd really like to get a bunch of Arduinos out to all these kids across the world. And they actually, in the new circuit boards they have, they have all these gaps in the circuit board where they don't actually have any need for parts. So they had all this free space, every laptop they produced. So they said, wouldn't it just be kind of like free for us to build like wiring on the board and then give this kit to people and then they can solder things onto it. So they had this whole concept and started growing it but the problem with this is every time you're doing a prototype, you need to think about, are you doing a consumer product that has to be like mass produced? Are you doing like an educational product where your end user is a kid who, I mean, kids actually know how to do soldering. It's, it's possible. If you go to Maker Fair, you see kids doing it all the time. Um, but they're probably not going to want to solder their entire Arduino board together from scratch. And or if it's a personal art project, you know, you just need to build one. So even if it's not economically feasible, you can just build it and then be happy with it. In this case, we had built this thing which was really exciting, but then if you thought about what's the scale of sending this out to kids in the developing world, it's like, well, they won't be able to do anything with it unless we've hand built it. So it actually turned out to be more efficient for us to just buy stuff off the shelf than to use even like this supposedly free uh, circuit board. Uh, but we wouldn't know that without trying out the prototype. We were really excited about this, and people were passing the prototype around, building their own copies, and then said, actually, this is kind of difficult. So it was really helpful to have a prototype in that case. Uh, this is my own project. I won't go into it so much now, but I don't I want, it's kind of like little bits, but I want it to be a little bit bigger. Kind of what people call it like big bits sometimes. Um, and so I don't know how to make like a big plastic thing. So I have these bean bags and just kind of sewed the circuits. That's another thing. You don't have to use just wires. Like you can have like, now there's like conductive ink and thread and Play-Doh and things like that. Uh, what you need to start, you don't have to say, think it's, the, it's gonna happen and change the world and all that. Your prototype is just like the first thing that you can do. And like once you have that, you're gonna get a better idea of what you actually want. Uh, is this just something that you know how to build or can at RobotsConf find out how to build is that's good enough to be your prototype. And the materials you choose, there are a ton of materials. Uh, you definitely use the materials you have in your kit when you're getting started and then try out like conductive ink or Play-Doh or thread if you haven't. Um, definitely really cool stuff and it will totally change the ability of what you can build with it. Like you can make a paper thin circuit with conductive ink that you couldn't make with an Arduino. Um, so yeah, custom boards take a lot of time to like as was discussed in the earlier talk. Uh, soldering is something you should definitely try this weekend. Sewing, if you can or would like to try, definitely do it. Conductive Play-Doh, I didn't make any myself, but it's a really good way if you have like kids who are interested in this sort of stuff to get involved in this without having to teach them all the electronics basics. Uh, so thank you. Uh, that's it for me. And uh, this is a quote from super awesome Sylvia. Uh, Go out there and make something. So, yeah. <laughs>